You know how they say life isn't a sprint, it's a marathon? Well, investing isn't a sprint, it's a marathon. And I think if you look at those six month periods, it can feel like a sprint. But to be a successful investor who builds wealth over a long time, you need to look at the marathon of it. So I look at those numbers and I'm like everyone else out there, I'm like, whoa, those are huge. You know, does that mean it's over? Did I miss it? Is it too much, too fast? But if you take a step back, it's not so crazy. So let's just focus on the energy numbers for a second. Um, energy, biggest first half ever, right? Crude, up so much. But if you look at it from a five-year perspective, it's very different. Actually, on an annualized basis over the past five years, the energy sector is down 5%. Meanwhile, crude, five years ago, was about a little over $40 a barrel. Here we are five years later, it's a little over $70 a barrel. You look at the stocks mm. behind that, things like Royal Dutch, Chevron, Total, you can look at some of the midstream companies like Kinder Morgan or, um, or Energy Transfer Partners or Enterprise, and they're trading at, at 12 times earnings, 14 times earnings. Many of them have three, four, seven percent dividend yields. If you take a macro look at that, you also see that the big ESG push has actually pushed down supply Meanwhile, demand hasn't peaked yet, and the alternatives like wind and solar aren't quite there to pick up the slack. So you can look at those big first half numbers, be jarred, think you missed the boat, but if you take a step back, you can see that there might be a long way to go still. There's still opportunity to invest in many of these sectors. Well, that gap between the stocks and the oil prices we have shown many times, Jenny, is a huge gap. When oil is at 70, the stocks tend to be at a certain level, and in many cases, they're 30 and 40 percent below that level. So a big disconnect between the commodity and the companies, even as their balance sheets get better. So does that mean right. that you're a buyer of a, of a Kinder Morgan or a Chevron or a Royal Dutch Shell? I am. Um, so not just a buyer today, not a new buyer. We've had these in the portfolio for a long time. But interestingly, Chevron, for example, I guess it was two weeks ago, we had extra cash. And so I rounded up the Chevron position for clients who didn't, who didn't have a full position in at that point. Clients who are coming in with new cash, that's what I'm putting them into right away because there's opportunity there. And I think one of your earlier guests was talking about how you know valuations seem rich or, or they're not cheap. But actually, that's the beauty of being an individual stock investor and not needing to paint with a broad brush. There are what, I can't even remember anymore, there's like 5,000 publicly traded companies. That means there's 5,000 companies to choose from. You're always gonna be able to find something that's not trading where it should be, that's at a discounted valuation. And I think there's a lot of opportunity in the energy sector, even though it's had this big run in the first six months. So yeah, that's a, to me, that's a comfortable, you know comfortable place to continue to put money. Okay, I think the only thing maybe more hated than oil and gas, of course, a lot of companies saying they just simply won't own it, not the case with the next group, has been New York City real estate companies. What we just talked about. I mean, a year ago, some of these mortgage REITs, Jenny, I don't need to tell you, looked like they were going out of business. I mean, we're watching their bonds were getting crushed. The equities were getting destroyed. These names have come back, but it sounds like an SL Green, maybe a few others, you think there are still, still money to be made in these names, which got just absolutely hammered last year. Right. And so I loved your previous guest, Kristen Jordan, um, because it completely supported a thesis that we have. In our portfolio, we have two investments that are supported by the resurgence return to New York City real estate. One is SL Green, and the other is New York Community Bank Corp, NYCB, which we just added last week. So these are interesting. They're still way off their highs. Um, SL Green, for example, has a 4.5% dividend yield, got crushed last year, trading as if no one was ever going to return to any office ever again. Meanwhile, their tenants are things like the big banks, the law firms, companies that actually did really well. They are, as we all know, painfully well. They are bringing their tenants back. And by the way, they have eight to nine year lease terms and their occupancy is still in the mid to high 90% range, even with everything that's gone on. So they have this very long runway. They have super high quality buildings. New York Community Bank Corp is really interesting. They lend to, um, to the owners of large apartment buildings, like not the super fancy ones, the ones where normal people who do normal things live. They only have about 3% um, vacancy rate and a 6% dividend yield. That should be a big beneficiary also. Shepard Smith here. Thanks for watching CNBC on YouTube.